Hey, Chris, my name's Steve Morgan. You just called me and said you sent me a letter about wanting to buy my property, and I didn't respond to you. Well, don't you think if I wanted to sell it to you, I would have responded and I didn't need you to call me? Don't call me anymore, you asshole. If I wanted to sell you something, I would have responded to you, dick. I paid thousands of dollars in courses to learn what you're basically teaching on your podcast for free. What you're putting out there is so valuable. So, you know, I just really want to acknowledge you and I definitely send everyone to your podcast. You were virtually one of the first mentors that I looked up to and started following. You're always one step ahead of the game. So I just wanted to give you kudos and props for that because lots of people are watching, lots of people are learning from it. Tucker and the whole TTM crew, Dan and Chris, thanks so much for your support. I love what you guys do and a huge, huge fan. Having this support's huge, so I'm grateful for that. What's up, everybody out there in Listener Land? This is episode 289 of the Real Deals Podcast and... As always, I'm your host, Tucker Merrick. I want to thank you guys for joining me. I'm back this week. Took last week off. Mr. Dan was out of the office. DJ DJ Dan, uh, the guy that's uh, behind all of this magic and uh, all of the beats that you guys hear in between segments. Uh, That's him. So anyway, he had a big life event going on uh, in a good way. And so he was out of the office last week. And so, um, you know, we decided that uh, we were going to hold the show for a week. And uh, on top of that, I had a lot going on. So I didn't want to just crank something out that uh, for the sake of cranking it out. And so I got to recharge my batteries a little bit. We got to close what was our biggest chapter uh, to date uh, for the company, for me personally, for our team. Uh, Just a real big deal. I I actually been holding the announcement, I guess. Some of you guys that follow me on social media probably know, uh, but we sold um, our million dollar builds house and we actually sold it uh, before it was ever done. So uh, it was about a 20 day uh, escrow uh, cash purchase and um, it was just uh, it was just awesome. So we sold it to some great people and uh, we went under contract at the uh, very beginning of uh, October and we actually then uh, closed on the uh, 20th. So it was, uh, it was a great deal, um, cash deal, so no appraisals, no anything and uh, great people that we sold to. And you know, honestly it's, it's a huge deal for us. I know I mentioned that, but you know we're we're selling into a three three and a half million dollar price point, which, you know, the reality is that's very thin airspace for you know the Portland market. Some of you guys that are in you know maybe L.A. or New York or some of these bigger markets, even Seattle to some extent, you know three million dollar plus is um, it's not quite as impressive. Uh, but here locally in Portland. You know, I don't know another builder that's built a spec home in the $3 million plus range. I know a number of builders that, um, you know, are doing, maybe not a number, but a, a hand, very small handful that are doing like ridiculous custom homes here and there. Then I'm sure all in people are somewhere in the, you know, 2 million range ish or more um, in terms of their costs and all that, maybe even three. But when you get into the world of spec building, uh, where you build for yourself and then sell it, uh, nobody's really doing that. There's guys that are, you know, creeping up on the $2 million, maybe two and some change, but three, I haven't seen anybody do it. So, uh, you know, we got to put a little feather in our cap this year, but you know, it was just a great journey. Uh, and one that we, you know, followed along, uh, in a video series, uh, the million dollar builds video series. So you guys got to actually follow this entire journey, uh, from beginning to end. And that was kind of the front facing journey, right? And so basically on this week's show, um, you know, as we get into next week and the week after, we're going to go back to our real our rock stars of real estate series because we got a lot more really cool stuff that I want to put out there. But I wanted to take a break from that and I wanted to kind of, you know, give you guys behind the scenes um, of this journey that I've been on, not only with that project, but just with a lot of the stuff that we've been dealing with over the last year. Um, you know, because a lot of the frontward facing stuff is it's the highlight reel, right? It's the stuff that, um, you know, everybody remembers and, you know, they basically establish your level of social clout based on and just all those things that are just kind of outward facing. And some of it's a little, you know, artificial. Some of it's not. I mean, obviously, we sold this house. We built an amazing home. Um, you know, it's a hell of an accomplishment. But it didn't come without a lot of pain and suffering and stress along the way. There's no question. So I want to kind of take you guys, um, you know, in this particular episode, kind of through my thoughts on this journey that we've been in over the last, well, 
been a long time. It's been over a decade now um, in this business of doing, you know, uh, having a real estate investment company that that's our core function. That's what we do day in and day out. Been buying and selling houses, uh, you know, for over 15 years now. But, uh, you know, actually having the investment company being the sole source of income. And then, of course, you know, now we've got our education company and our technology company, things like that, that have kind of bolted onto it. But, um, you know, when I turned the ship from having a mortgage company to development company, it was end of 2008, beginning of 2009. And here we are just about 2020. So I guess it's about 11 years um, in terms of that. So I want to kind of share my thoughts on this journey now that, you know, I feel like we've reached the pinnacle thus far. Definitely not the pinnacle in our journey overall but thus far you know this journey is kind of peaks and valleys and we've definitely we're at a peak right now and so now it's a question of kind of where do I go from here what do I want to do next what do I want to accomplish next because that's just how I'm wired I, I, I'm not one of those people that sits back on, on my laurels and says you know this is what I did and you know back in high school I was amazing and that's just the end of the road of, of trying to achieve more and and more and more greatness, I guess, uh, internally. And, you know, that's a, a big thing too, I guess. A lot of people are always talking about their whys. And I think I've done a show on this where, you know, a lot of people say their families are why and this and that, which it's a great why. I'm not knocking it by any means, but I feel like at a certain point, you know, if you really want to be great at whatever you're doing, your why has to be kind of a little more selfish. It has to be internal. It has to be a lot more of you just feeling like you need to really do the best with the tools that you've been given in life basically your potential right and so that's that's a big part of my way but anyway i want to talk about this journey and then i also want to talk about the state of the market i want to have kind of a an honest conversation here about just everything that's going on in this real estate investor space because to be honest, it's a bit of a circus right now. It really is. And it also is a bit of, um, you know, there's a bit of high school going on. There's the cool kids table here and there and everybody's jockeying for social clout and who knows who and who hangs with who. And I'm not knocking it. It's just, it's a, it's just the truth. <laughs> it's just what it is. And so I just want to put it out there. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys recognize it, you know, being more, um, you know, not only in the business, but on the influencer side of the business as well. You know, maybe I, this stuff, I see it more clearly um, than others as well. But I want to give you my thoughts on it because we've had a long run up in this business. And usually what happens is when the market crashes, it cleans out a lot of this, right? Um, you know, jockeying for social cloud, guruism, whatever it is, it, it clears them out. Most of them go bye-bye right um, and then it starts to build again when the market st starts to get better and we've had such a long run of the market being good that that amount of guruism you know uh, and especially you pair that with social media now it's just gotten out of control so anyway I want to give you my thoughts on that not to bash that necessarily but just to really die you know dial in on the narrative that is being pushed right now that I'm hoping you know, a lot of you guys that hear it don't feel like that's the only way that you got to do this business in order to be successful because that's the one thing I don't want to have happen. So anyway, that's going to be this show. Not that long, but uh, very truthful, very behind the scenes and hopefully at least get you thinking because uh, that's the point of the show, right? All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So do yourself a favor, reach out to Ironbridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. So let's uh, let's talk about the first thing, which has been my journey over the past year and kind of the challenges, right? You guys have followed me on 
Facebook or otherwise, um, you know, you get the frontward facing stuff. You get the good stuff. You get the, the happy, happy, joy, joy, butterfly and rainbows, you know, the beautiful end products, um, which are great, right? That's why we do this. That's the end payoff that makes all of this worth it. And it's important to show that stuff off. But on the other side, there's a lot of struggle every single day. There's a lot of stress every single day. There's a lot of phone calls where you want to rip somebody's fucking head off, right? Uh, that's just what it is, and that's the nature of this business. And so I know virtually all of you guys out there, if you're actually actively doing this business, you have those feelings as well. But I want to talk about them real quick. So our Dunthorpe project, right, that we sold, um, it's now done. We've closed that chapter. You know, this was a really challenging project. On top of it being probably our, at the pinnacle of our, um, you know, project uh, or careers to this point, um, you know, collectively as a team, just design-wise, project-wise, price point-wise, um, just stature, where it was, what it is, how quickly it's sold, you know, how revered it's going to be now that it's going to be on the front of a magazine as well. Um, you know, one of the bigger magazines here in the Oregon area for homes and whatnot, you know. There was a lot of challenges that went on behind the scenes. Um, you know, I mentioned a bunch in our Million Dollar Build series, but you know, every day with this project was a battle. Um, every single day, and the reason being, number one is, you know, we had to deal with uh, some contractor issues in the house behind us, and they were, you know, trying to charge us like ten thousand dollars and just being a giant fucking pain in our ass, like just huge. And they gave us a bill. They were threatening to, you know, try and do all kinds of things to us if we didn't pay it, and it was just an absurd bill. And um, it's unfortunate because. You know, there, it just is unfortunate. It's it's too bad that, um, you know, there's idiots out there that uh, feel like they can do that. At the end of the day, they left it alone and we didn't end up paying anything because they really didn't have any grounds to charge us for anything. Uh, but it just was mental bandwidth that it took up. Uh, countless nasty emails and phone calls and arguing and bickering and just it just taints a, a week very easily when you deal with that kind of stuff, right? I'm sure many of you have. Um, on top of that, you know, every day was a battle because when you build a house like this, right, that's just, uh, it's a beast of a house, it's a super high price point, even if you use subs that you have used for years, there's a percentage of those subs that don't care where the project is and they just charge you accordingly. That's just, the, you know, and those are the good guys, I call it. And then there's the guys that, especially now with the market as hot as it is, they forget who's been feeding them all these years, you know, and every time they think that they can just get one over on you or gouge you a little more, or take a little more here and take a little more there, they do it. And so literally every single day we're fighting with people over billing and invoicing and pricing and this and that. And it's just, it's exhausting to be honest with you. You gotta fight with all these numbskulls every single day. And the only reason they're trying to charge you more is because they feel like maybe they can and that the project warrants it. Even though the work that they're doing is the exact same. And we had to do that day in and day out with these numbskulls and um, you know not all of them are numbskulls some of them are very you know valued members of our team as subcontractors but there were a handful that just made this a real challenge uh, to get to the finish line and so that was a big challenge every single day um, of course we had you know neighbor issues we had city and permitting issues on this one galore I mean it was crazy the amount of difficulties with the, the permitting on this one because we never had the same inspector they uh, wouldn't tell you when they'd come out. It just, it was a huge pain in the butt. And we had to get all of our plans, not only approved by city of Portland, but also Multnomah County. So it was kind of this ping pong back and forth of red lines from one organization and then another and another and another and back and forth, back and forth. And it just made this really, really difficult. So that was that. And then under all of that, on the back end of the stuff that I deal with, um, you know, we run a lot of private capital through the company. We've uh, established a number of long-term relationships with people where essentially I run a fund uh, to some extent for, you know, a, a good number of millions of dollars that we put to work constantly for people. And it's, it's informal fund, but, you know, there's, there's paperwork to make sure that everybody's protected and this and that. Uh, but I have free reign to take that money, invest it however it is that I see fit in order to generate a return. That return then, um, you know, is paid out to the investors and then we get to keep the difference of, you know, whatever I agree to pay them. Well, the challenge is, is that in the middle of this project, I had a $2 million note called due. And that makes for a very difficult uh, and stressful situation for me uh, because now we're trying to finish out this project, which is a huge capital suck. I mean, we're talking, you know, millions of dollars. And I have a note that uh, is being called due uh, for, you know, legitimate reasons, but it was somewhat unexpected. 
And so it's being called due in the middle of this whole process where we have this giant project and I've got $2 million that I got to pull out of my ass that's currently in the, you know, working in projects. And, um, you know, we planned on paying back at a point that we close chapters uh, if we're going to pay it back and just not on a whim. So we're kind of fighting against the clock on that, trying to get projects done so that we can clear the deck so that we can satisfy this debt and, um, you know, basically get that debt off the books and satisfy, uh, you know, our investors in full. Now, fortunately, we got there and we were able to do it, but let me tell you, when you got a $2 million note called due, uh, that's a lot of stress that it puts on you. That's a lot of challenges that you have to face. Um, but that's the reality of this business when you step into the next level and you start doing these things. Um, now, we structure debt other ways as well. That's property by property. But, um, you know, you can structure things all kinds of ways in this business. And uh, it was an advantageous structure for us for a long time. Uh, but the estate at this point, you know, they've got uh, next of kin that are chomping at the bit for their money. And uh, that's what happened. So, Anyway, that was a big challenge for us. Um, and then on top of all of that, you know, I'm fighting with another project that we've been fighting on for three years, uh, four years now, um, that uh, the city of Lake Oswego said was in a historic slide zone. Uh, well, I should say this, it's not moving. It's never been a slide zone. But what we got down to at the end of the day is that this area where we bought this property was mapped as a potential historic slide zone back in 1972 for political reasons. It never actually was tested or proven to have moved in any way, shape, or form. And the reason why they did that is because uh, originally some of the uh, politicians and city leaders were trying to push to put a pipeline through this hillside, but there was some objection to it. And so that objection then hired geotechs to go out and basically craft a narrative that said that this is a potential slide zone and therefore the pipeline cannot be put here. And so then that carried forward all the way to today, and I have been fighting against this narrative that was a false narrative put out there for the last 50, 60 years, right? Um, that uh, now I've had to prove wrong. And fortunately now we've proved it wrong, but I was fighting this battle behind the scenes, which has cost us tens of thousands of dollars on top of over a half million dollars just to buy the property itself, all kinds of geotechnical work, meetings with the city, uh, countless meetings with the city, borings, inclinometer readings, all these things to prove that the original mapping of this area as a slide area was false. And they still don't recognize that it was false, but they recognize that it has never moved and it's not moving. So now we have a buildable lot. So we got to the finish line of being able to call this a buildable lot during this whole process with our Dunthorpe build and all that. But that's a lot of stress, right? We got a $2 million note call due. We're building a $3 million plus spec home. We've got, uh, you know, five, 600K of investment out there in a lot that we're trying to build, which is an amazing lot. And we're fighting the city on whether or not it's buildable. You can imagine, it's a fair bit of stress, right? <laughs> so that's not the outward facing stuff you see, but that's the stuff that you uh, deal with behind the scenes when you start to get to this level. Now, on top of all of that, right? Let's layer in some other stuff here. Just, And I'm not complaining, I'm just showing you guys uh, because I think it's important that you deal with stuff behind the scenes. That's what I'm showing you here. And so the last thing I wanna mention is our Driving for Dollars app, right? We put it out at the beginning of this year and we thought that people would use it responsibly um, if we had a, an unlimited plan, let's say, right? And what I learned was really quickly is that this whole new phenomenon where you have, um, you know, uh, phone numbers where you can basically text and, and RVM people, uh, it's become, you know, kind of a, a big way that people try and market because it's cheap, right? And so generally, if you do driving for dollars and you're not getting those things and you're just getting the information on the homeowner so you can direct mail market them, it's kind of a natural governor on how much or how big of a list you build because then you actually have to spend money to market to them in a certain amount, right? And that then governs how much or how big of a list you build um, that then you market to. Well, we had a lot of people because uh, all they wanted was phone number, they were pulling you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, records on any given day. And so uh, basically it put us in a really difficult position where we're eating a, just a huge amount of cost for these people that really aren't pulling houses because they're good driving for dollars leads, but because um, you know they just want that data for basically free, right, after a certain point. And so that's why we had to restructure the entire app. That's why we had to basically break it all apart, put it all back together, um, and uh, you know eliminate this huge liability every month that it was creating by having all these people pull this data. Now, 
fast forward, right? That was a really difficult time because we were catching backlash. People were calling us all kinds of names. Dan was catching so much shit every day. It was unbelievable. Uh, but now fast forward six months later and um, we've got it set up. A, it's a tiered program and uh, we're growing faster than we've ever grown. And especially with our competition jacking prices up, uh, now people are starting to realize that you know our app was an investor built app for investors and not a software guy building it to try and capitalize on investors. So um, it's not a knock on our competition. It's just that's the reality of the situation, right? And so now we're at a point where, like I said, we're growing faster than ever. We have a bigger customer base than we've ever had, and the app's better than it's ever been. Um, but we had to restructure and rebuild this entire thing, right? It's a difficult thing to do on top of all the other stuff that we've got going on. So that's behind the scenes. That's what we had going on. At the end, we got to the finish line on a lot of this stuff, which is the most important thing. That's the thing that, you know, ultimately we're going for. And that takes me back to the quote where, you know, adversity puts a man face to face with himself, right? That's a quote that I had from a previous show. You know, that this year, it's been a whole hell of a lot of adversity. But you know what? I made it through. I popped out the other side. And I have to say, it feels good to pop out the other side because now I know what I'm capable of dealing with. I know what I'm capable of getting over and handling. And uh, it's a lot more than, than most people. And uh, I still have a long ways to go in terms of personal development and able to handle different things and kind of grow as a person and a business owner. But, you know, I definitely tested myself this year in a lot of ways uh, to handle stress, adversity, challenges, issues, um, problems, and uh, to be able to pop out the other side um, and, and be, you know, successful or as uh, drama would put it in Entourage, victory! Right? So, anyway, that's my thoughts on all that. Hopefully, you guys enjoy here the challenges side of this business and not just the rah on the front. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, this marketplace that we're in right now. You know, we've had a long run up and I mentioned this and with that long run up, man, there are some serious characters out there right now. Back in the old run up, we had Preston Ely, right? He was probably uh, that and the short sale kid. Those were the two biggest characters in the space, right? Crazy hair, says crazy stuff, um, you know, just total pattern interrupt type thing, you know, not your typical kind of middle-aged kind of frumpy white dude that's talking about investing in real estate, which is basically what it was previous to that, right? Now you got this younger guy with crazy hair tattoos, you know, talking about crazy stuff. He's got a sidekick that's got leopard print hair. That was kind of the, the circus back in 2008, 9, 10, right? Well, now, fast forward to today, man, that circus is like pff, injected with steroids and there are just, you know, <laughs> there are some interesting folks all over the place, especially with social media now. Like, they're everywhere. Um, you know, it's it's almost like uh, some sort of a red carpet event every time, uh, you know, there's a big event going on and the way people dress and the flamboyancy and this and that. And it's, you know, I get it. They're brand building. They're trying to be, you know, recognized. They're trying to be unforgettable. Um, so I'm not knocking it. It's just the truth. It's what it is is right well one thing I do want to say is this because this is my Nostradamus prediction for this business that everybody should listen to and then the mantra right now is grow 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 scale 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 you know do as much as many deals as you can build your team um, you know all those things right and again I'm not knocking the desire to take over the world and to dominate your market and to grow 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 because you know what that's all the things that I have within me that's made me get to where I'm at now. Um, so it's the same hustle, it's the same uh, desire, it's the same, all those things. But for whatever reason, this business has gotten to the point now where the you know the thing that's basically you know everybody is pushing as um, you know what they should do or the way that they should do this business um, is one way, right? And you know there's not one way to skin this cat. There's a million ways to skin this cat. And so if you don't feel like you need to grow a big team and do a hundred deals a year, which by the way in a lot of markets you just can't do that, uh, it, just because of price points and whatnot. It's just you know it's very specific to certain markets where you can hit those kind of numbers. Or, it's, or I should say it's much more difficult in other markets. Um, but, you know, if that's not something that resonates with you, guess what? It's okay. It's okay not to want to do 100 deals a year and have a, a huge wholesale operation. It's okay to do 10 to 15 deals a year and make good spread on all those deals and have a smaller operation and have a much better quality of life and not have this team that you've built with a lot of people that have zero real estate experience. And most of these big operations, by the way, the guys running them have very little real estate experience. They're in it two, three years, four years max, right? They ain't seen shit 
in terms of how this business really works. And I mean, here's my Nostradamus prediction for you, and I, everybody should listen to this because a lot of these bigger operations right now that are wholesaling a lot of stuff, their model is to sell the dumb money most of the time, right? You sell the sizzle, not the steak. You sell the, the desire uh, to flip houses. You sell the dream. You sell the HGTV show of I can flip a house, and they're the conduit that connects these people that are fairly unsophisticated with dumber money to, fit, to flipping houses, which is why they get more money for them than most you know savvy investors would pay a lot of the time, right? Or they're selling to funds, right, that are just buying for a yield. Guess what happens when the market slows? Dumb money goes away overnight, poof. Funds stop buying overnight, poof. So you know who they're left to sell to? The savvy guys that are in the market. And you know what? They don't pay that much. And that's gonna put a lot of these businesses in a very difficult position because they have a ton of overhead the way that they're set up. And that's gonna be a day of reckoning. It's gonna be a day of challenge for them. And some will make it through, uh, for sure. But it's gonna be very challenging. You cannot continue to sustain a lot of these businesses when the market slows just based on their business models. Now, this is what everybody should listen to that has one of those businesses. If you have one of those businesses, you better be ready to pivot. And when I say pivot, you better be able to take those deals that you're finding and retail some of them yourself. If you don't have the capital, if you don't have the ability, if you don't have the contractor relationships, if you don't have the realtor relationships to be able to take those deals that you find and retail them yourself, you're gonna be dead in the water. You're gonna be like a lot of those people that got washed out in the last tide when the market slowed. And that's just the fact of the matter. And uh, so the reason why I tell you this is because I don't want you guys to idolize what you see out there on social media when there are some serious cracks in those foundations, serious uh, for a lot of those people. Now, some of them may be thinking otherwise, you know, have other plans. But, you know, the one thing that drives me absolutely crazy is when I hear people tell me that they're planning this and that for their recession proof business that haven't been through a recession in real estate. Right. If you haven't been battle tested, your opinion means nothing to me because you really don't know what it's like. You're just going off hearsay and secondary information. And most of the people you're getting that secondary information from haven't been through cycles. <laughs> so you got the blind leading the blind or the blind talking to the blind and then they're regurgitating it to the masses. So anyway, this wasn't meant to be a harsh podcast by any means. It was just meant to be a stern warning of what you follow, what you idolize, and the type of business that you should be building. So if you're building a business that's at scale, you better have a retail component to that business because you're going to have to do a lot more retailing when the market slows because that dumb money is going to disappear overnight as soon as real estate is no longer in vogue uh, to flip houses and people look at it as inherently more risky. So it's exactly what happened the last time and it's exactly what's going to happen the next time. When that happens exactly, I don't know. Uh, you know, the run up, there's been lots of articles on, oh, we're going to have a downturn and now they're saying millennials are coming back in and they're going to buy a bunch of houses. So who knows when it's going to happen, but I can say for certain it will happen at some point. So anyway, that's... Uh, Kind of my thoughts on that and now where i go from here right where am i going to go well we're going to keep doing the podcast i'll be honest with you guys you know the the wholesaler culture uh, what it is uh at this point in the business it doesn't resonate with me i mean you know the reality is that the core skill set resonates with me and that's where we've been generating all our deals for years and years and years and we'll continue to do that but you know the what's glorified and the that particular business and how it's run that high friction hamster just cranking on that wheel all the time i don't like that business at all i really don't like that mantra i just don't like any of it to be totally honest with you and that's not a knock on it it just doesn't fit for me and so moving forward you know i think that we're going to continue doing what we do in terms of uh, uh, continually marketing direct the seller to find deals, but I think we're going to try and do bigger projects. We're going to try and make more impact. We're going to try and make more legacy. We're going to try and make bigger moves. We're going to try and continue to grow that real estate ladder. We've hit that that first big, well, I won't say first big, but we've hit a big pinnacle for our business right now. And so for me, my job now is to figure out where do we take it from here? How do we use that high point as a launch off point to go even higher and do bigger things and do better things. I, I just don't want to be that guy that's, you know, trying to do a hundred wholesale deals a year and that's my thing. I want to do something much bigger. And, um, you know, that's always been my goal. So anyway, that's me. That's what I've got going on. Different strokes for different folks. You know, you guys do you, I do me. That's the way it works, right? So anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed my thoughts this week. If nothing else, it's thought provoking. It gets you to think a little bit and it gets you to see that, guess what, man? I deal with shit all the time too. Uh, just like you and, uh, you know, just like everybody else that's in this business trying to, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, right? So anyway, that's episode 289. I'll see you all on the flip side catch you then.